So apparently, someone found a critical flaw in Bitcoin's design. It's called the double spend attack, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to spend your Bitcoin twice or get paid twice, which is a problem because it goes against the very idea of Bitcoin being rare. In fact, as soon as the news spread and people found out, the price of Bitcoin dropped like a rock. We even had the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen come out and tell us that we needed to find a way to curtail or cripple cryptocurrency so as to limit their criminal activity. If you're an investor in Bitcoin, that sounds like Bitcoin is dead. Now that title or some variation of it, Bitcoin is dead, is actually a very popular title that people like to use to describe Bitcoin sometimes. In fact, it is so popular that there's an entire website that's dedicated to counting just how many times Bitcoin has died. And since 2010, Bitcoin has apparently died 395 times. And just this year in 2021 alone, in January, Bitcoin has died three times already, but somehow, it's still here. This confirms Elon's theory that we probably do live in a simulation world and that somebody must have figured out the Final Fantasy VII W item glitch and they just made an infinite amount of Phoenix Downs to revive Bitcoin. <laughs> Smash the like button if you got the reference. But check this out. This is just how much people don't understand what Bitcoin is and how it works. Because I was watching a video from Lou, the guy who runs Unbox Therapy, who is arguably one of the biggest tech YouTubers in the world, besides maybe MKBHD, whose channels I love. They don't watch my videos, but if they did, love your guys' work. And in one of Lou's videos on one of his channels that talks about this same subject, I found for a very brief moment at the top of his search bar, he looked for something called Bitcoin stock. Now I love Lou and his work, but that tells me that if someone that tech savvy, someone who's one of the biggest guys in tech is searching for Bitcoin stock, which isn't a thing because Bitcoin is not owned by a corporation or a CEO, and he's still trying to figure it out, that tells me that the rest of the world probably has no idea what it is either and that we're still trying to figure it out and that we are still very, very early in this space. So let's everybody take a breather, calm down, and let me explain exactly what actually happened. Let's hypothetically imagine that this playing card is like Bitcoin in the blockchain. It's totally nothing like it, but <laughs> just go with me on this one. And let's hypothetically imagine that somebody did a double spend attack on Bitcoin. Here's what would happen to the blockchain. It would split temporarily into two different versions, which is interesting because by design, Bitcoin will always revert back to one valid chain with the most proof of work on it. That didn't make any sense, so <laughs> let's just watch the rest of this video. Hi, my name is Andre Jake. Hope you're doing good. Hope you're feeling well. Come for the finance and stay for the sorcery. But let me show you exactly what just happened. So picture this, it's Friday. I'm in the middle of filming a video. My roommate comes from work, rushes through the door, runs upstairs and he's like, Andre, Bitcoin has been hacked, there's a flaw. And I'm like, what? There's no way, right? Unless there's a 51% attack, right? So I kid you not, I Google this and within three seconds without reading much, I log on to Gemini and I buy an entire Bitcoin at $30,000. So <laughs> why did I do that? How did I know so fast and what just happened? So first, let me introduce you to the delicious concept of FUD. FUD means fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And if you wanna be a Bitcoin investor and you wanna live in this cryptocurrency world, you have to understand that crypto is still very much the wild, wild west. Except Will Smith isn't starring in this one and people be trying to steal your girl. And by girl, I mean Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm just kidding, half kidding. But for the longest time, for 10 going on 11 years now, people that have been involved in FUD and spreading misinformation have made a generous profit off of the ad revenue, off of crashing the price of Bitcoin so that they can buy more for themselves. But at the end of the day, here's what you actually need to know. So let me preface this explanation with a visualization of what's going on on the blockchain. And I know I've explained this part before, but I promise it's gonna really help you understand this next part because it gets very nuanced. So remember, anytime we use Bitcoin or we send it to each other or we use it to pay for something, it doesn't matter. Our transactions get broadcast to the blockchain and our transactions get sent to a block, kind of like this Rubik's Cube right here. But because this Rubik's Cube is only one megabyte in size, it's of a certain limitation and a physical size, it can only hold so many transactions before we have to move to a different block. And this is where the miners come in because they see this juicy block and they're like, ooh, that's got some coins inside. And then they use their fancy computer power to then solve the Rubik's Cube and get their rewards, which is pretty cool. But here's the thing. 
These miners who use their computers are also part-time bus drivers, which I know is a weird part of the analogy, but bear with me. Here's where it gets a little bit more technical and I'll continue with the analogy and then I'll tell you exactly what happened with the double spend. But in order for our transaction to get confirmed and get included in this block, we have to pay a small fee to use Bitcoin or get on the bus. Technically, we don't have to, but if we don't attach a fee, then we could be waiting for the transaction to be confirmed for a very long time. So again, picture yourself waiting at a bus stop for the bus to come, which arrives roughly every 10 minutes. And when it does, imagine that this bus driver is highly motivated by money, where people bribe the bus driver to then get on the bus. Basically picture New York City. <laughs> now this bus has an obligation to wait for roughly 10 minutes while people continue to bribe him to then get on the bus. Now picture this. Once the bus arrives, you look around and you notice there's a bunch of sketchy looking people because generally that's how buses are here in Las Vegas. I don't know about you, but these people represent transactions, which includes anything from sending Bitcoin to each other or using it to pay for something. But at this point, you have several options. Option number one, the bus comes and you say to the bus driver, I'm sorry, man, I don't really have any money to give you. So the bus driver's like, ah, oh, it's cool, man. I'm gonna wait here for about 10 minutes. And if the bus is empty, I will take you on and then we'll go somewhere. And therefore, your transaction gets included in the block and therefore gets confirmed. But the other thing that can happen is the bus arrives and it's full of people. So the bus driver's like, sorry dude, gotta go. And then he leaves without you. And then another bus comes and this process repeats itself over and over again. The next bus could very well be empty or it could be full. It really depends on how busy the Bitcoin bus is that day. Now in theory, you could be waiting for the bus for several hours or even several days before a bus empty enough comes on and accepts your frugal habits, which is why people typically attach a transaction fee in order to bribe the bus driver to take them on. Which brings us to option number two. A bus comes, you bribe the guy, you give him a transaction fee, he takes you on, your transaction's confirmed, everything is good to go. That is an overly simplified analogy of how Bitcoin works. So now that you hopefully understand that part, if you don't press the J button on your keyboard to go back 10 seconds, here's what happened on January 18th. Someone sent a transaction to the blockchain, AKA somebody is waiting for the bus. And once the bus arrives, he tries to bribe him, but the bus driver looks at him and he's like, nah, son. And so remember, he doesn't take him on, but he still has to wait there for around 10 minutes. And this is kind of where my analogy falls apart because whenever you pay a transaction fee, it's not like you actually pay it and if it gets rejected, you lose the money. It doesn't work like that. Instead, it works more like a contract that you broadcast to the network. And as soon as you broadcast it out there to the network, it will wait there to be accepted. And as soon as you broadcast it, you cannot cancel it. It will exist there until a bus driver does come who will take you on their bus. And the place where these transactions exist is called the Bitcoin mempool or the Bitcoin memory pool. That is the technical word for it. And in the case of my analogy, this is basically where all the people wait to get on the bus. Now what this guy does is he makes another transaction exactly like the one before, except this time he attaches a higher transaction fee. So now he's paid twice, except technically not really. All he's done is he's issued two separate contracts and now he waits to get picked up. The technical word for this is called RB or replace by fee. And the reason people do this is because imagine you're waiting at the bus stop and you see all these buses come, but they're not taking you on because you're being way too frugal. So you're just chilling there with your 20 cent iced coffee and you're like, man, I just wanna leave. And so you attach a higher transaction fee so you can get included on the bus earlier than everyone else. And this is not always a necessity. It's only a necessity when the Bitcoin network is clogged up because there's a lot more people at the bus stop and they're waiting, right? And as we know, there's been a huge surge in popularity for Bitcoin. So now there's a lot more people at the bus stop, AKA the mempool, which is again, composed of unconfirmed transactions that are competing against each other. So here's what happens next. So again, to quickly recap, he bribed, he vibed, but mostly he denied. <laughs> Remember, the first transaction that he sends has a very low transaction fee, so it really gets denied and he is stuck waiting at the bus stop in the mempool for over a day. It is now January 19th, one day later, and he decides to rebroadcast that same transaction with a slightly higher fee. So now there are two outstanding contracts that are waiting in the mempool because remember, you cannot cancel them. They're going to exist there until somebody picks them up. Now his second transaction, his second bribe, if you will, gets denied yet again and he 
he's stuck waiting at the bus stop. By the way, the thing on the side right here is for all of you technical nerds who wanna know how much transaction fees he paid in terms of Satoshis per byte, which by the way, a Satoshi is the smallest denomination of Bitcoin. Like if Bitcoin was a dollar, then a Satoshi would be a penny essentially. So, so far his second transaction is stuck in the mempool. An hour goes by and he gets sick of waiting. So he issues a third transaction with a transaction fee. And it's this second RBF, the second replace by fee that gets accepted. So the bus comes, he takes the guy, he drives him away and the transaction is confirmed. And it's at this point that the internet goes nuts. Before our guy issued a second RBF, the blockchain network actually split into two separate coins. We had one Bitcoin over here and one Bitcoin over there. And this happens one or more times a month. And what's interesting is that these miners, which are remember the people who solve these Rubik's cubes, which are also the bus drivers, now saw a fork in the road. And some of them had to go left and some of them had to go right. They had to decide which path was the true true. But based on Bitcoin's design, there can only ever be one real path. And the way that gets decided is based on which coin is the heaviest or contains the most proof of work. Or in the case of my analogy, the one where most bus drivers pick. In this particular case, the contract that was ultimately accepted as the final one was his original broadcast transaction, which remember was the one with the cheapest transaction fee, which he had to wait. So how can that be then if his third transaction was the one that led him on the bus? Bus. Did he pay twice? So remember, Bitcoin is the matrix and I'm seriously running out of analogies. But even though the reality was split into two separate forks, and even though he paid in this alternate reality which led him on the bus, it was in the one that had the most proof of work, AKA where most bus drivers went down, that became the final reality, the one that had the most proof of work. And to the outsider, it looked as though he paid in both universes. But since there can only ever be one real universe, AKA the chain with the most proof of work on it, he only paid once. Ultimately, everything was resolved and the infinity stones were placed back in their original timelines and everything is fine. It's heavy, I know doc, but the short answer is there was no flaw that was found and Bitcoin was designed to work exactly in this way, which is also why Bill Gates called it a tour de force because it really is. And it's also why it's so valuable. Believe it or not, Bitcoin is capable of dealing with anything you throw at it, almost even quantum computers, believe it or not. But that's a story for another time. But as soon as I found out that the price dropped like a rock and that it was an issue of a misunderstanding of RBF, I immediately logged on to Gemini and I bought $30,000 worth of Bitcoin right when it dropped. Because I understood that people don't really get the technical aspect of how Bitcoin works. They don't understand the real value of it. They only see the price and then they panic. Don't be one of those people and go get $250 worth of free Bitcoin using my BlockFi code right here. Like I said in the beginning of this video, there's a lot of people that stand to benefit from spreading fear, uncertainty and doubt and misinformation because it gets them views and clicks and ad revenue and it makes them money. But even though I've been obsessed about personal finance forever and I've been following Bitcoin since at least as early as 2014, I don't fully know how it works and all the intricate nuances about it because I'm not a software engineer and there's people that are far smarter than me that can probably explain this stuff better. But at the end of the day, if someone like Lou from Unbox Therapy is searching for Bitcoin stock, then that tells me that most people in this world probably have no idea how this stuff works either, which also shows me that we are still so, so early in this space and why the price is still so volatile. But more importantly, we can confirm yet again that Bitcoin is not dead and it's very much alive. The honey badger is still kicking. <laughs> but if you'd like to get started with investing, you can grab four free stocks from Webull by depositing $100 using my link below. Two of those stocks could be valued up to $1,600 each. You can grab a fifth free stock from Rob Hood. Love you. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful to you. I will see you back here on Monday and Friday, sometimes a Wednesday. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.